Hey guys, welcome back to another episode of Some Pie. And I know it's been a while since I've uploaded, but we are here today. So let's get into it. Today we'll be doing some differentiation past papers starting all the way from 2019. And then we'll be attempting to try our best to get down to 2015. So looking at this first past paper here, um, we see that they are requesting us to differentiate implicitly. And before I even attempt this question, I just want you guys to recall that when you are differentiating implicitly, you have to remember that it's a bit different when you are doing those uh, partial derivatives. So be sure not to uh, mix up the two. They are very different. Personally, partial uh, derivatives are way easier. Anywho, so let's see this question. So we have a function. It's equal to zero. That's a good thing. And they want us to use implicit differentiation to show that dy dx is equal to this something. So first up, it's a proof. And we love proofs because we know what we're working towards. So I am going to start off by writing proof here. Yeah. Okay. And uh, we are going to begin. Now, with implicit differentiation, it just simply means that your function is written in terms of multiple variables. In this question, we have the variables x and y being present. So what you need to observe is in the question, they are asking us to differentiate y with respect to x. So uh, that means where y is present, if we were to differentiate, say y squared, right, with respect to x, then you can go ahead and differentiate normally. The differential of y squared is 2y, but that's with respect to y. If you're differentiating a variable with respect to a different letter, I always tell my students to target or mark it or place a, a little symbol next to it. So the symbol you place is basically the uh, differential. So in this case, we are defining um, dy, the x. So just for example, just for a little recall for you guys to remember, if you are differentiating a variable and it's not with respect to that letter that the variable is, always remember to place a tag at the end. And that's the key feature in implicit differentiation. So let's get into it. All right, so I'm gonna try my best to highlight each term I am differentiating, okay? Um, let me erase this here. So the first term we are going to attempt to differentiate is 4x squared. Now, can we differentiate a variable x in terms of x? Yes, we can. That's a clean differentiation. Differential of 4x squared is simply 8x, right? And we move on. Plus, now over here, second term, we can see we have the product of two functions, one of them being 3x, the other y squared. So in implicit differentiation, the product rule is applicable. You can choose to go to the side, which I will here. Right, so we have 3xy squared, and I am going to choose to call this part of it my u, and this part of it my v, and we are going to differentiate using our product rule. Now remember your product rule just goes like this, u, derivative of v plus v, and your derivative of u. In this question, we are differentiating with respect to x. Keep that in mind. So continuing with our answer, applying the product rule, our first term we are going to write down is u, which is 3x. Then the derivative of v comes next. Now observe that our v term is y squared. So the derivative of y squared, if we were differentiating with respect to y, would generally be 2y. But because in this question, we are differentiating with respect to x, we have to place a tag. And the tag we place, simply what we are differentiating with respect to. So over here, 
using our product rule, we now have found that v dash is equal to, and I'll write it in brackets, 2y dy dx. All right, some brackets, it helps with the answers, it helps with the jumble. All right, we have actually not finished our product rule. Now we have to move on to v, and v is y squared. You do not need to tag v because you have not differentiated. The product rule simply requests that you write down your value for v. Next on board, your product rule is requesting you to differentiate u. Now u is 3x, so because it's in terms of x, this is a standard differential. The derivative of 3x is simply 3. And you could write it in front, but I'll just write it in brackets. Okay, and then finally, moving on to the easier parts, we are going to differentiate 7x with respect to x. That's just a standard differential of 7. And once again, the next term is a single term there. We are going to differentiate 3y. Now, the differential of 3y with respect to y is just 3. But because we are differentiating with respect to x, we have to tag, write our tag at the end. You are differentiating with respect to x. So that's all you need to remember um, when you're differentiating implicitly. If you are differentiating a variable um, and it's not with respect to whatever is on the bottom, you just write a tag next to it. And finally, we write our equal. A lot of students forget. <laughs> we have an equal sign here. And then what's on the right hand side? It's zero. So you guys are lucky. The derivative of zero is simply zero. And I'll place a nice little uh, working column line here so we can clear up this clutter. Now, all that's left for us to do is simply group our like terms. So what I'll do is I'll group by um, terms that do not have that dy dx next to it. And we have three of them. We have 8x, we have plus 3y squared, and then we have plus 7. Nice. And then I'll continue with my terms that do have that feature of dy dx in it. I'll multiply these two terms to get 6xy. And that's dy dx there. And then finally, 3 dy dx. We're almost there. I can actually see the answer, but I don't want to rush it. Over here, what you have to do is you want to try your best to try um, carrying terms across that equal sign. So I'm going to take all these terms here and I'm going to carry them across my equal sign such that I will get minus uh, 8x plus. 3y squared plus 7. You could have changed the sign in front of each term. It actually doesn't matter um, once you are accurate in how you write out your answers, okay? And then on my left-hand side, what I'm going to do with these two terms is I'm going to factor out those coefficients in front, all right? And I'm going to have my 1 dy dx there. So I just simply factorize those two terms that were written in terms of delta dy dx. And then finally, last step, and you see we are approaching our answer. Last step is to simply say that dy dx is equal to minus 8x plus 3y squared plus 7 all over now, you can see that they factorized their solution there. So we will do the same thing. Uh, 6xy plus 3 is the same as 3 into 1 plus 2xy. You can expand and just verify if you're not sure. But if we were to multiply this, 3 by 1 gives us 3. And 3 by 2xy gives us 6xy. It's just written back to front. Okay, guys, so that's the answer there. I included some brackets because I love my brackets for clarification. They did not. They chose to write the uh, minus sign down in the middle to highlight that it's a negative answer. You can too if you like, but that answer is fine as it is. And I will close my proof with my lovely QED box sign. And there you have it, guys. That's how you would differentiate something implicitly. Let's go on to the next part. So here's the part two to that previous section. 
Now, I like the way they created the question. The first part, they had us implicitly differentiate and then just in case you mixed up because you know you're nervous you're writing an exam and you mixed up partial differentiation, boom, <laughs> on screen, it's right there in your face. Um, it's gonna, the question actually helps you realize that, hey, here I am, this is what partial uh, differentiation looks like. You mix up your symbols, go back and correct it if you made any mistakes. And partial differentiation looks so complex, so complicated, but it's so beautiful because when you're differentiating stuff uh, and it contains partial derivatives, you always have to remember that this is the one where you set, where you always set a variable, one of your variables as a, let me just erase that there. You set it as a constant. All right, and you guys know that derivative of any constant is always equal to zero. So, for partial derivatives, this helps greatly because a lot of stuff just gets eliminated, right? So let's see this question. It's a proof for sure. They're asking us to show. So we're going to start off our answer with proof. All right. Statements are very important. And uh, in the proof, we can see we have to find... First of all, we have to find four different types of partial derivatives. So I'm going to do them in different colors, and I know it looks confusing. So let's attack the first one, shall we? <laughs> attack it with our minds. So the first one, uh, let me do this in red. We have our delta f x y over delta y and whoa it's starting to look confusing but it isn't do you know that uh, these brackets just simply tell us the variables that are present in your question your function happens to be in terms of two variables x and y so this symbol just looks complicated but all they're, all they're really trying to tell you guys is that hey just fine delta f delta y you know the function is in terms of x and y so it can help. If it helps, you guys can rewrite some of these things. Uh, you know, you state um, that, yes, you understand that your question is in terms of two variables at the very beginning. And then after that, you can continue with a shortened form. So I am going to start out my question like this. I'm going to write delta F in terms of X and Y all on delta Y. I'm going to write down that I kind of understand this is just delta F, delta Y. So my examiner knows that I have that understanding. And now what I'm going to do is simply find my function. It's over here. This is your function here. And I'm going to go ahead and differentiate that with respect to Y. Now remember we are doing partial derivatives here. We are not implicitly differentiating. Partial differentiation means to observe your variable on the bottom there. We are differentiating with respect to y only. If any other letter pops up, consider it a constant. It's gone. There is no tagging here. So looking at this question, um, we have our first term there being uh, 4x squared, right? So our first term being 4x squared, if we were to differentiate 4x squared with respect to y, that's zero because x is considered to be a constant, right? So if x is a constant, then 4 is a constant, that whole thing just goes to zero. Next up, we are going to differentiate, let me write it to the side, we are going to attempt to differentiate 3xy squared with respect to y. Now, here is where students get lost. They go ahead and they use the product rule. A product rule is used when you have two distinct variables. But in this question, you have to remember that for partial derivatives, there is only one variable 
when you are differentiating with respect to a particular variable, in this case y, then you set that one variable as the only one that's varying. Everything else is a constant. So in this question, x, for this part rather, x is actually just a constant. So you will not use the product rule here because if x is a constant, it's really just one term. 3x is a constant, right? So if we consider that 3x is just basically a constant, then this is just a number. How do we differentiate y squared? The differential of y squared is simply 2y. And if 3x is a constant, we just write it back. And at the end of the day, when you multiply those two terms, you're going to get 6xy. So partial differentiation of 3xy squared with respect to y only gave us 6xy. So now we have completed differentiating that second term with respect to y, keeping x constant. Now we move on. So we have uh, this two term here, that's 7x. Once again, x is a number, x is a constant, so the derivative of that is just zero. And then finally, our last term, our fourth term is 3y. If you are differentiating 3y with respect to y, that's just straightforward 3. And you're done. That's it. Nice and easy, right? So let's see what else we have to find. So we just found out, uh, just erase this here. We just got the value for this one. So now we can go ahead and let's try working out this one. Now, they are asking us to find delta f with respect to x and y delta y squared. So in essence, what they're really asking us to do is to differentiate delta f delta y a second time. So we are actually going to differentiate this with respect to y a second time. Okay, so this is really differentiate 6xy plus 3. And um, this one is really, really easy. I think I'll be able to fit it on one line. Remember, if you're differentiating something with respect to y, that every single thing else is a constant. So in this question, 6x is just a number. Just keep thinking of it. 6x is a number, 6x is a number, 6x is a number. If I'm differentiating y with respect to y, that's just 1. And just remember, you have that number in front, 6x. So 6x times that 1 is just 6x. And the differential of 3 is 0. And you're done. So we have found the second one. Let's move on to find the third one. See, it's not that bad. It's actually not that bad. Moving on to the third one, um, I see that we have to differentiate uh it's a two-part differential, so what I'm going to do is actually differentiate the fourth. I'm going to find the derivative of the fourth term before here so that we can uh, find some kind of uh, flow. All right, so what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to find delta x first. All right? So we have this function once again. We always go back to the function. This is what you are always differentiating with respect to different stuff, right? So in this part here, notice that they are asking you to differentiate your function with respect to x. So looking at this, our first term, all right, so let me just use the eraser here. I don't like the clutter, all right? So looking at this here, our first term 4x squared, if we differentiate 4x squared with respect to x, that's just 8x, all right, nice and easy. Then you want to differentiate 3xy squared with respect to x this time. So this one we had differentiated with respect to y. Let's differentiate with respect to x this time. So I'm going to kind of just erase this so you don't get confused looking back at it. All right, so we have uh, 3xy squared. 
and we are differentiating with respect to x so that y squared is just a variable just remember that and if it's just a variable if you differentiate 3x you'll get 3 and y squared is a variable as well so you're actually going to get 3y squared so that's 3y squared so we just differentiated this with respect to x next up differentiating 7x with respect to x you'll just get 7 and if you differentiate 3y with respect to x you're gonna get 0 why because y is a constant it's like a number so 3y could be like 3 by 6 that's 18 differential of 18 is 0 because they're all constants right so there we have it um that's the derivative with respect to x now we are going to actually use this and we are going to actually get straight into d2f uh, dx squared. So, well, this doesn't imply that. Let me just draw a dotted line here. What I'm going to do is I'm going to differentiate this a second time with respect to x so that I can find this. So looking at this, if I differentiate that one more time with respect to x, you'll get 8. All right, and of course, this would be considered to be a constant. So the differential of that with respect to x is zero. Similarly, this is a constant. Derivative of that is zero. So how much stuff have, have we found for our um, proof? Three. Now we need to find one more. How do we break down this two? What is that equal to? Let's go to the side working column for a bit, shall we? So we have our d2f dy well it's delta okay and uh, if I had to break that down this is really finding delta delta y of delta delta x right so make sure that you know how to break down these partial derivatives so you know that you have to differentiate which one first etc so this means that we are actually to find delta delta y of what of this and what is delta delta x let's look let's search ah we found it here here it is delta f delta x all right let me just put in my f here totally forgot it all right is 8 x plus 3 y squared plus 7 boom and what's the derivative of that with respect to y well, the derivative of that with respect to y is simply equal to, let me see, the derivative of 8x as a constant, setting x as a constant is 0. Derivative of 7 is 0, so we'll just end up getting 3 to the 6y. And there we have it. We have finally found all the values of our partial derivatives that are found in the question. Now what we need to do is to put it all together. So I'm going to try my best to put it very close to the question on screen. Um, actually, I don't think I'll be able to do that. So I'll have to write on the bottom. Let me just make this a little bit smaller. All right, guys. And we're going to get into it right here. I'm going to draw a nice little line here. All right. And we're going to try our best. Okay. So we're going to start off. Let me isolate this down here. All right, so we're going to start off with this. All right, so we have 6. And what's after? Delta F, delta X. Sorry, delta F, delta Y. That's this one here. So in brackets, I'm going to write 6XY plus uh, 3, is it? Mm -hmm. And then they follow it up with minus 10. All right, cool so far. And that is equal to, what do, we, do they have? Delta 2F, delta Y squared. That's this one here. That worked out to be 6Y. So I'm going to put it in brackets. And then, that was that one there. Then next up we have in brackets. Notice they have the brackets here. So I'm going to put that in brackets as well. We have delta 2F, delta Y, delta X. Um, delta 2F delta y delta x where is that one um that one oh i did mix it up actually let me just uh erase this one for a moment all right 
So this one was actually delta 2F delta Y squared, which is 6X over here. We just made a little boo-boo. And this one over here is the 6Y. So, yeah. Um, glad I picked up on that error early. And then finally, we have our last term. Let's look for it. It's delta 2F delta X squared. Where is that? Here it is. And that value is uh, 8. So you'll notice that both sides look a bit different, but I guess all we need to do is expand brackets. 6, 6 is a 36 XY. 6, 3 is a 18 plus 18 minus 10. And at 6, 6 is a 36 XY plus 8. And of course, you guys know that 18 subtract 10 is equal to positive 8. So you can also include that as your last line. And then you can end your proof with your lovely QED box. So we have proven that using implicit differentiation, that 6 delta, X, delta F delta Y minus 10 is equal to that right-hand side. That's pretty long to see. Okay, guys, so key pointers for you guys to take away. If you don't have different colors, try sectioning off your answers. Try spacing it out. I have not done the best job of spacing it out on screen because I wanted the answer collaboratively on one shot. So when I'm putting it together, you guys can see where different parts came from. However, in the exam, it matters a lot the way you space out your answers. It helps a lot to see mistakes and just keep your mind focused and tell yourself, you know, X is a constant, X is a constant, Y is a constant, Y is a constant, and you fly through partial differentiation with ease. All right, guys, so stay tuned. I think this is the last question on 2019. We'll be moving on to 2018 up next. Okay, guys, so we are moving on to 2018 here. And you see that you have two functions, one being called x, and it's written in terms of the variable t, and the other one being called y, and it's written in terms of t as well. From the moment you see anything like that popping up, think parametric, because you're dealing with a case of parametric equations. Okay, guys? And parametric uh, differentiation is quite simple. Um, I think one of the basic chain rules you need to remember for parametric uh, differentiation is this one, where you want to find dy dx. So at the end of the day, you want to generate dy dx, but there's a third variable present. Whatever that third variable is, you just cancel it out. And this is your main chain rule that you would use to find for dy dx in any typical parametric equation. They also even mention that the curve P is defined parametrically. So that's also a hint if you didn't know what type of differentiation this question was dealing with. Okay, cool. And with parametric equations, you simply just start your question by differentiating with respect to your variables involved. So that first uh, equation, we have x being equal to t on 1 plus, that's t there, yeah, that's a comma. So, I mean, the two variables are x and t, so pretty much what you can find is dx with respect to t. Yeah, you will have to differentiate this with respect to t, there's no other choice. And it's clearly a quotient, so we would be using the quotient rule here, your top term being u, your bottom term being v. And also recall that for the quotient rule, when you have the quotient of two terms there, the quotient rule goes like this. It's always all over v squared. And you would get v derivative of u minus u the derivative of v. Now, a lot of people like to write v du dx minus u dv dx, and it gets complicated because, remember, it's not so super smart to do that. Your variables that you are differentiating with respect to are not always going to be x. So you don't want to write du dx and dv dx. You just want to write u prime, v prime, 
just a hint to remember that you have to differentiate those variables, right? So yeah, that's how I like to write it. Of course, you can choose to write it differently if you want. All right, so applying the quotient rule quickly here, we're going to just end up getting, I usually like to write my denominator. I was using purple. I don't know what happened. <laughs> so we have 1 plus t squared. And on top, we have v. Our v is 1 plus t. And u prime means to differentiate u. And we are differentiating with respect to t. So differential of t is just 1. That's just 1. Minus u, again, that's t. And all over, we have some lovely doggies in the background barking. They probably don't like parametric equations. Who knows? It's not for everyone, you know. All right, so v prime, we have to differentiate 1 plus t. The derivative of 1 plus t is simply also 1. So this is a nice, simple, sweet uh, differentiation. And on the numerator, we'll end up getting, what's that? 1 plus t minus t. So that's just 1. I know some of you all want to see it, so I'll write it. It's 1 plus t and then minus t. So these t's are canceling, right? So just that's what's happening here. So that's how I'm end up, I ended up getting 1 on the numerator and you have 1 plus t squared, all squared, sorry. And moving on with life, we are going to go ahead and do the same thing for y. So let's get into it. We have y being equal to t cubed. Oh, they want to get all difficult with us. We're going to just flow through this very, very easily. All right. We won't back down. We know what we're doing. So I'm just going to draw a little dotted line here because I don't have space to write it below, really. I mean, I do, but I want you guys to see everything on the same page as best as possible. Yeah, and I did write dy dy. <laughs> All right, it's dy dt. And once again, we're going to use that uh, quotient rule and we're going to have 1 plus t all squared on the bottom there so i can see things cancelling yay yay and we have v which is one plus t the derivative of u is three t squared minus u just t cubed derivative of v once again is one so let's see what's happening on the numerator here we have expanding the top we'll get 3t squared plus 3t cubed minus t cubed. All right, so what's going to cancel here? 3t cubed minus t cubed gives us 2t cubed. All right, so that's just 2t cubed. All right, on top there. And on the bottom, we have 1 plus t all squared. I'm not going to factorize these two terms just yet because I'm not sure what's going to happen when I use my product rule. So let's see first and we'll figure it out as we go along, right? I'm going to just minimize just a little bit and put this together. So using our lovely uh, chain rule, we have that dy dx is simply equal to what is it equal to? First, it's equal to dy dt. And what was dy dt? dy dt is this here. So that's this. So let's write that. 3t squared plus 2t cubed all over 1 plus t all squared. Multiply by what? Multiply by dt, the x. Now, the x dt is equal to this. So therefore, dt dx means that you just need to flip it. So flipping that, you will get the 1 plus t all squared on the top over 1, right? So just remember to flip. You know, usually um, you would have to flip your second uh, term. Right, and a lovely cancellation is happening here. So that just means that we're getting dy dx to be equal to 3t squared plus 2 t cubed and uh it's not a proof so we have no idea if we're going correct or wrong but um i do have the answers around so it's definitely correct so far and we are also not finished answering our question it's kind of like a second part it over here they're asking us to find the gradient of the curve at a particular point and this point 
is a xy coordinate because coordinates are in terms of x and y, not t. So you have two values. You have the value of x being a half. You also have the value of y being a half, right? So we could substitute those values into our gradient, but the problem is that our gradient is in terms of t. So if only we had a value for t, we could find that value for the gradient of the curve, which is what they want at the end of the day. So how do we find that value of t? Think, think, think. Have you figured it out? Well, it's actually nice and simple. I'm going to just erase this at the top here for want of space. And uh, the people did say that uh, we have two values, x and y. And if you recall that from the very beginning, they gave us values for functions in terms of x and t. So you can actually substitute the values of x being a half and y being a half into either of these equations to generate that t value. I'm actually going to use the easier one. So I'm going to use the x uh, equation where they have x right is equal to that's t all over 1 plus t there and they told us that they want the gradient when x is a half right so what I'm gonna do is I'm going to actually replace this x with the value of a half and we're gonna just do some algebra okay nothing too spazzy just going to cross multiply here, you'll get what? Uh, you'll get 2t is equal to 1 plus t. You kind of carry across terms, you'll get 2t minus t is t being equal to 1. And that's it. You have your value for t. You have found your value for t to be equal to 1. And that's nice, simple, sweet. And all you have to do is substitute that value of t being 1 into your gradient and you find your value for your gradient um, at the point a half a half so when uh, t has a value of one you will get dy dx to be equal to three that's by one plus two by one well it's cubed and squared but you know you also get three plus two which is five and that's your answer. Of course, you can't end with a QED box because it wasn't a proof. Um, I know a lot of students are going to question something. And the mistake some of you guys might make is you may have used T as a half and substituted it into here and here. And that would be wrong. Please remember when they give you a coordinate, it's an XY coordinate. You need to generate your own values of T, okay, guys? Um, try your best not to make that mistake. And of course, some of you guys are wondering why did they give us a second value? Well, you could have used either. You could have used um, the second equation uh, over here. And you could have also generated a value for T. Chances are you would have gotten something like T squared is equal to negative 1. So you could have like cause that value to be invalid, just cancel it off. And you would still end up with the value of t to be equal to one. So either equation you use, just in case you're wondering, how will I know which equation to choose? Either equation you use, you're gonna end up with the correct value of t in order to generate that value of five for your gradient. So don't be too concerned about it, right? Um, maths is a subject that no matter which route you take, once your method is mathematically sound, you will always end up with the same answer. It's just some people take a longer road, some people end up there faster than others. That's the way it works. All right, guys, stay tuned. There's another part to this question. So let's get there. Hold on. Okay, so we're back to another part. And reading this question, <laughs> you might get a heart attack, to be honest. <laughs> it says, hence, or otherwise, determining the x and y intercepts of the tangent that touches the curve at the point a half, a half. Recall part one, you found the gradient as five. Now you're probably thinking to yourself, whoa. I have no idea what they are asking me to find. Well, you know what helps? Go back to T-terms, key terms, K-E-Y, key terms in your question that ring a bell, such as tangent. You guys know what a tangent is. It's that straight line that, you know, 
touches a curve at one point. And remember previously with parametric equations, parametric equations deal with curves, right? So now we do exactly know what the curve looks like. Uh, who knows? It probably looks like uh, this, something like that. I'm not sure. I'm just guessing. And uh, they're saying that somewhere at a half, a half. Let's just pretend this is a half here and this is a half here, right? That's the x, y coordinate over here. They're saying somewhere here, there's some kind of tangent passing through the curve. All right, so if I had to draw a tangent, ooh, wow, All right? Some kind of tangent passing through. You know, they're saying obviously that tangent is going to have intercepts. It's going to cross that x-axis at some value. That's called the x-intercept. And it's also going to cross the y-axis at some value. That's going to be called the y-intercept. So hence or otherwise, determining the x and y intercepts of the tangent that touches this curve at the point a half a half. So how can we go about doing this? Well, you know what? It would actually be very helpful if we knew the equation of that straight line. Because you see, when you have the equation of a straight line, it's very easy to identify the y intercept. That's simply whatever value c is. Okay, and your x-intercept just simply takes place when y has a value of zero. So if you knew the equation of your tangent, then you can find both the x and the y-intercepts. So we are going to use this knowledge to our advantage. And our first train of thought is, let's find that tangent. So let's do exactly that, shall we? Now, every straight line takes the form y equals mx plus c. But do we have the juice required to find that equation? Well, if you think about it, <clears throat> when a tangent is touching a curve at a particular point, tangents actually have the same gradient of the curve at that point. So therefore, it means that this value of m here is actually 5, the same as the gradient of our curve at that point. So therefore, we have one value, we have five. What about x and y? Now, because our straight line is passing through that point a half a half, we can actually use those coordinates for our tangent, right? And guess what? Very nice and sweet, we can find c. And this is just straightforward. What are we going to get here? This just implies that C is equal to a half. Subtract 5 on 2. That's negative 4 on 2. That's just simply a negative 2. So we found the gradient. Sorry, the y-intercept to be equal to negative 2. Therefore, the equation of our tangent is just equal to y is equal to 5x minus 2. So boom. Minus 2 means that our y-intercept is equal to negative 2. And what about our x-intercept? What about this value here? Where is that straight line cutting the x-axis? That would take place when y is 0. Uh, if we set y to be equal to 0, you can write down what you're doing so your examiner can follow. When y is 0, you will get 5x minus 2. That implies that your x-intercept, I'm doing some quick algebra here, but 0 equals 5x minus 2. If you just go and do some working, that just means 5x is equal to 2. x is equal to 2 over 5. Right, guys? So pretty much that's it. That's how you would attempt this question. I know it looked way easier when you saw the answer. Okay, but you guys know the problems always lie with respect to knowing how to start the question. So just play back the video, go back to the beginning, see how I guided my train of thought. I held out the keywords tangent. I thought about what I had before. Hey, by the way, it was a hence question. Uh, so you have to state that you did hence. Okay, and uh, yeah, you just plan it out. You never give up 
you start writing and you see where it takes you, right? Um, so I think this is the final question in this part. I'm not sure. Just stay tuned to see, right? So I'll see you soon. Hold on. Okay, guys. So it looks like the next part is not related to the uh, previous parametric equation, but based on the symbolic notation that delta you know it's partial derivative so yay we're gonna get to keep a specific variable as a constant so upon first first observation you notice that we have two key uh, functions there you have sine of kx and then you have sine of aky and you know usually you'll start thinking you know product rule etc but remember with a partial derivatives uh because one of the variables is a constant kept a constant when differentiating um the uh, product rule doesn't really apply so much, okay? So let's see what they're asking us to find here. Now, del d2f dx dy, we can break this down, okay? So we can break this down into delta delta x of uh, delta f and delta y. Okay, so we're going to break it down into those components there. And we're going to begin. First up, I am going to attempt to uh, differentiate my function with respect to y. So I'm going to find delta f delta y, which means that if I see x, it's a constant. So in this case here, you can think of, remember, k is a constant. And if x is a constant, that's kind of like you're finding sine of 5 or sine of 90. This whole thing is just a constant. So you can just make it invisible in your mind it's there it's a constant but you don't have to consider that as a function right so if you want to differentiate this function in terms of y the derivative of sine is simply cos so you write cos of uh, a k y and remember when you're differentiating uh, trigonometric functions always remember to multiply by the derivative of whatever is in brackets so if you differentiate let me see a is a constant and k is a constant so therefore that a and k would be brought out at the front there and that's it um now also you have to remember that this that we blocked off here is a constant it's just like a five or a six it's always there it was always there to begin with so you want to write it back because it is a part of your answer right so that's sine of k x and that's it there and pretty much um, we're done you can clean up this to look like delta f delta y is equal to bringing our constants together you would have a k of uh, sine of kx i'm writing all my constants at the front and then cos of uh, a k y all right so we're done there next up we need to find ddx of this so we're now going to find delta delta x of all of this a k sine k x of cos a k y notice my notations notice what i'm doing be very careful you don't leave out your brackets and take your time so now we're differentiating with respect to x so therefore y is a constant so you consider this as a constant this is a constant so what i'm going to do is i'm going to write my constants all the way to the front cos of uh that's a k y that's just a constant so i'm writing it and then the real big boy in this question is simply that that's differentiable because that's in terms of x and the derivative of uh sine is just simply cos right so Da, 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 da. let's just pull this back down that's simply cos of kx and of course when you're differentiating something and it has a, a chunk inside you want to pull that out so the derivative of kx would be k right so we'll make this k squared here and pretty much that's it and that's your answer you can rewrite it as d2f xy 
all over delta x delta y is equal to a k squared cos of a k y cos of k x and it was not a proof so i guess in exams you'll never really know if you're correct but it does help to know that method means everything. So once you have all your correct notations, once you have your expansions correctly written, you'll gain your marks for method and there's always, you know, the little error carry forward and stuff. So don't give up if you find your answers look wrong, just keep working and uh, you can always come back and check it over at the end of the um when you have finished your, your paper. All right, guys, so um, stay tuned with me. We are going to move on, I believe, now to 2017. Yeah, so hold on, we'll get there. 2015 is coming soon. Okay, so on screen, we have a scrupulous differentiation. It's as easy, as difficult as it looks. Yeah, I said that right. A lot of times you guys are not um, familiar with doing the differentials of um, inverse functions such as sine inverse, cos inverse, tan inverse. You always do sine, cos and tan. And uh, you have to remember that there are also standard integrals for sine inverse, cos inverse and tan inverse. On screen I have written them to the side over here so that if you ever um, can't find them, you can always come back and you can just screenshot this over here, right? These are the three standard integrals for the inverse functions of sine, cos, and tan. So when this question looks as it does with those inverse signs, don't get too scared, right? It is what it is, and we're going to make it look so simple, we're going to get this answer out in probably less than two minutes. All right, so looking at this function, we have cos inverse of something in brackets. Now, which one of these can we use to find the first derivative? What's the first derivative? Well, the first derivative of something just looks like this, and that's as simple as just differentiating for the first time. So, if the differential, the first derivative of cos inverse of x, when you have, let me highlight this, when you're finding the derivative of the inverse of cos and that term after that inverse sign is simply x. Your standard form is given by, let me write it big and bold, cos inverse of x. If you were to find the derivative of that, it's just simply equal to minus 1 all over the square root of 1 minus x squared. Now here, we have x. When you have x on your left, you also have x on your right. What happens when you don't have x? What happens if instead of x, you have sine inverse of x? Well, you simply replace. So you'll notice any question, instead of cos inverse of x, they have cos inverse of a big chunk. So all we are going to do is do a little replacey, replacey. And we are going to replace that x with sine inverse of x so that our question looks like this. Cos inverse of sine inverse of x is equal to, and down here, we are also going to replace this with sine inverse of x and it was squared, all right? Just remember that squared sign was there. Cool. And also, whenever you are, if you were to differentiate, uh, you know, um, sine of, let's just say, 2x, also, whatever you have as your chunk, you have to differentiate that and multiply by it. So, for example, if we were performing a simple differential, this would be cos of 2x. Yes, we use the standard differential, but we also multiply by the derivative of the chunk. So with that in mind, you have to remember for this question, our chunk is this, right? What we have in brackets. So what's the derivative of sine inverse of x? Well, it's right here. The derivative 
of sine inverse of x, plain x. We just simply x is given by 1 over the square root of 1 minus x squared. So all you have to do for this question is just multiply by that. I'm going to erase that last one there for space. And we are going to simply multiply by the derivative of our chunk, which is 1 all over the square root of 1 minus x squared. And pretty much, uh, that's it. That's your answer. Um, as simple as it goes. The derivative of cos inverse sine inverse of x is given by uh, negative 1 over the square root of 1 minus sine inverse x all squared multiplied by 1 over the square root of 1 minus x squared. Can you simplify this? Uh, not really. I know in exams you wouldn't have any idea if you can end right here. But the reality is there's no way, there's no kinds of substitutions you can really apply to simplify this any further. The question did not explicitly state to make sure your answers are in terms of, you know, um, a particular something. So therefore, this is your final answer. Um, so yeah, got out the answer in less than two minutes. There we have it. Um, and let's move on to the next uh, question. Okay, guys, so we are looking at the part, well, it's a part B to the previous part, but they are actually no way related. It's a fresh, unattached um, part of that question, okay? So they have a function W is defined as W. It's in terms of two variables, X and Y. That's what this uh, means here. And um, it's given by ln of uh, 2x plus y all over x minus 1. That modular sign just signals that you are only considering positive values um, within those uh, brackets. Well, straight brackets there, right? Okay, so um, now if you have a function with a quotient and you're dealing with lons, remember your rules of lons, first things first, you can actually rewrite your function in the following uh, way, right? Um, before even reading the question, I <laughs> actually started to think of my rules of lines and splitting this up into a more workable form, right? You're going to have ln of uh, 2x plus y there minus ln of uh, x minus 1, okay? And we are going to go ahead and read the rest of the question. They say part 1. Given that delta w delta x um, is equal to negative 1 over 9, at the point 4, y0, calculate the value of 0. Now, um, you need to be able to recognize the type of uh, notation they have. This is delta w delta x. This is partial, right? This is partial derivatives. So in this question, when you are attempting to differentiate, so we are going to differentiate delta w with respect to x partially. Lons, you know, you simply write uh, that on your denominator and you differentiate it and you write your differential on your numerator. Now, if I differentiate 2x plus y with respect to x, then I will get uh, 2 on the numerator. And I will get no differential for y because I am setting y as my constant. It's like a number. So using the key idea that this is partial derivatives you're dealing with, you would clearly have to um, recall that you have to set your variable y as a constant. Okay, cool. And then moving on there as well, we have for the second part, you have x minus 1 on the bottom. Now, our both our, all our variables here are differentiable with respect to x. Um, so the differential of x minus 1 is simply 1. And that's it. You're pretty much done differentiating there. So next up, what we're going to do is we're going to use what the question gave us. They told us that delta w delta x actually has a value of negative 1, 9. So we can actually um, now substitute that, that delta w delta x is negative 1, 9. And it's also, it also takes that value at the points x and 
y, where x is 4, so we're going to have uh, 2, 4, and that y value has a value of y0, right? Minus 1 on x has a value of 4 minus 1. And we're going to just attempt to simplify, and this will clearly create a nice little equation, and we can just solve for the value of y0. So getting into it as quickly as we can, we would have, uh, what's that, 4 choose 8 plus y0 minus 1 over, um, 4 minus 1 is 3. We just go ahead and do a bit of, um, we carry across our 2, so that becomes... That's 2 over 9, all right? So make sure to use your calculators there. Uh, you'll have a third minus 1 over 9. That's 2 nines is equal to 2 over 8 plus y, 0. Um, now, here's a little secret, right? I can actually tell that the value of y, 0 is going to be um, 1 here straight away without even cross-multiplying. And it's a trick. I mean, when you have an equal sign, both sides are supposed to be identical. So if I'm seeing two here and two here, it means that the denominators must be exactly equal to each other. So therefore, 9 has to be equal to the sum of 8 plus y0. And for that to be true, y0 would have to be equal to 1. So that's my little shortcut there. Of course, you guys can do it the long way. You can choose to cross multiply and you would still get the same answer. Okay, um, but that's my little shortcut for this question, and that's the end. Stay tuned, we're going on to the next part soon. Okay, so uh, this next part here is associated with the previous question, so I place a recall to remember that our function was ln of 2x plus y minus ln of x minus 1. Because we are going to need to use that function to perform partial derivatives so that we can complete this prof here. So we're going to start our setup. I'm going to write the word prof here. Okay, and there's a couple of stuff we need to find. So um, one of the first things we can find is delta w with respect to, mm, let's find delta y. Because we need to find all of these values in order to um, find out if it's equal to zero. Well, it should be because it's a proof. So we have our function w in terms of x and y. Remember, when you're doing partial derivatives, people, the differential is with respect to your variable on the bottom there. So everything else is a constant. So in this question here, this partial derivative that we are working out, x is your constant. So everywhere you see it, it's a constant. So here it's a constant, here is a constant, which means this entire chunk here is a constant. Immediately, if you are differentiating, this will go to zero, right? Just take note of that. All right. So the derivative of w with respect to y, we have a ln term. You're going to have your denominator. It has the variable y present, so we can do a regular differential of ln. And the differential of 2x plus y, where y is the variable, would be 1 on top, right? The differential of 2x with respect to y is 0 because 2x is a constant, right? You're setting that as your constant. So, and then, of course, your second part here, this just simply goes to 0. The differential of that entire thing is just a constant, so that goes to 0. And you're done. Um, now, what else do we need to find? We need to find the 2w, uh, dy, the x. So what we're going to do is to get this, we're going to find uh, d, dx of uh, d, dy. All right, so we're going to work out, uh, oh, sorry. Mixed it up, man. I mixed it up. Actually, what we're going to find next is dw dx. All right. Um, dw with respect to x. What are we going to get? Well, let's see. If you differentiate uh, w with respect to x, you're going to get same, almost the same thing, actually. You're going to get... Uh, 2x plus y, and the derivative on top would be 2. 
because you're differentiating it with respect to x this time. And of course, you're also going to have uh, that x minus 1 on the bottom and your derivative is going to be 1 on top. So what else do we need to find? We need to find uh, the 2w dy squared. So we can get that. We can get this value from this one here. We can simply, well, it doesn't imply. I'll use some uh, separation tabs here. All right. All right, so I can find d2w, actually it's delta, delta 2w delta y squared by simply breaking that up into delta delta y of delta w delta y, which is the same as delta delta y of, what's delta w delta y? We found it to be 1 on 2x plus y. So it looks like we're going to have to use uh, the quotient rule here, where you're going to have that numerator on top being u, and we're going to have that being phi. Um, let's see what we're going to end up getting. I'm going to have to probably draw a next little section here to get that value. And using the quotient rule, you're going to generate a denominator of 2x plus y all squared. And you're going to get V, a du with respect to Y, that's zero, right? The differential of one is just zero. So this is just zero minus a v, um, v d d x minus U, that's one, dV with respect to Y. What's the differential of this V with respect to Y? Well, if you differentiate 2x with respect to y, you'll get 0. And you differentiate y with respect to y, you'll just get 1. So this whole thing goes to nothing, and we end up simply getting minus 1 all over 2x plus y all squared. Not too shabby, not too shabby. So we have found the value for this. We have this completely. And the last up, we just need to find this. So to find that... Um, let's see, delta 2w, delta y, delta x is broken up into delta, delta y of, delta w, delta x. And that's the same as delta, delta y of, we found this to be equal to this long thingy over here. So we're going to write it out, 1 over x minus 1. And it looks long, but it doesn't look too bad. It doesn't look too bad because we're differentiating with respect to y. So immediately upon differentiating, this whole term will just go to zero. So we're really just differentiating the first term there. And um, let me just minimize this here so it could fit on screen. All right. If we had to differentiate 2 over 2x plus y, we would use the quotient rule there. Right. And that would give you b squared, that's 2x plus y squared, um, v, which is 2x plus y by the derivative of a constant is 0. So that goes to 0 minus u, which is 2 by the derivative of v. Now remember you differentiate in respect to y, so the derivative of this will just be 1, right? Because 2x differentiated with respect to y is 0, right? So the differential of y is just 1. And this works out to be a nice, simple negative 2 all over 2x plus y all squared. Boom. Now, all that's left for us to do is to put this left-hand side together and see if we are going to get 0. I think I see it happening. I actually really do. Yay! So, putting it together is the final, final part. And victory will be ours all right, so the question says, this first one here, d2y, d2w, delta y, delta x, which is uh, this here, right? That's negative 2 all over 2x plus y all squared minus 2 by what? 2 by d2w dy squared. That's this here, right? d2w dy squared. That's this. We started from here and we ended up getting this. That's minus uh, 1 all over 
2x plus y all squared. And there is your answer. Um, this just simply works out to be uh, minus 2 on 2x plus y squared. Minus y minus is a plus, plus 2 on the same thing. Okay, this cancels to get 0. And boom, I can't say like flash because we took a while. Okay, but we'll survive. I love proofs. Because that's how you know you got it right, man. So, with a lot of effort, sweat and tears, we got there. And now you guys have had a lot of experience. Hopefully, we're close to the end of our tutorial. I think we have two more years to go. And uh, yeah, stay tuned for the next fast paper. I hope you guys are really understanding um, how to do partial differentiation at this point. Okay, so stay tuned. Four more, we're almost done. Don't give up. Okay, guys, so we're back with our final paper, I think. This is perhaps 2016. Well, not quite the final paper. I did say we'll do 2015, but I don't want to go too far back where the syllabus has changed and you guys might be seeing um, different kinds of questions you don't need to know. Okay, so keeping consistent and up to date with our syllabus. Um, looking at this question, we have a parametric, so you know how it goes. You recognize it because you usually get two equations in terms of t. Uh, you never know one day it's going to come in terms of a different uh, variable, maybe, who knows, q or something like that, right? But the key thing to look for in parametric equations, plural, you have two equations. And they're both in terms of the common third variable, a common third variable. So first up, I am going to write down my first equation there. We have x is equal to 4 cos t. And I am going to differentiate this, dx with respect to t. And the differential, of course, is minus sine. So I'll get minus 4 sine t. Very simple. Next up, we have uh, y is equal to 3 sine 2t. So this is like a double angle. So we have dy dt is equal to differential of sine is cos. So that's three to the six cos 2t. Remember to always multiply by the derivative of your chunk if you do not have a plain t or a plain x or whatever. Okay, a lot of students forget to do that, to differentiate your chunk, multiply by it. So finally, what's our chain rule? Well, our chain rule goes like this, dy the x is simply going to be equal to dy dt multiplied by dt dx. Putting everything together, we will get dy dx is equal to, let's see, dy dt was 6 cos of 2t multiplied by dt dx. So we have to flip this because this is dx dt. So flipping that, we will get minus 4 sine t. And we're done. That's it. Um, now, they're asking us to find the x coordinates, plural, of the two stationary values of the function. Now, stationary values occur when... So that's one bit of information that you would have needed to know. Stationary values occur when your gradient is equal to zero. That's your turning point, you know, when you have a curve, that point at which it changes direction, that turning point, that's where your gradient is uh, zero there, right? So they want to know what are the x-coordinate values where this is happening. So seeing that we just found the value of the gradient, all you need to do is set your gradient to being equal to zero. So um, dy dx is equal to negative, we have negative 6 cos of 2t all over, um, what's that, 4 sine of t being equal to zero. Uh, simple cross multiplication would send that denominator to be equal to zero. You'll just end up getting pretty much that uh, cos of 2t is equal to uh, zero because uh, let me just show you guys in case you never knew what I'm doing here is cross multiplying for so 4 sine t by zero gives me zero 
And then I would have taken this negative 6 and carried it across. 0 divided by negative 6 is still 0. So I ended up eliminating both my denominator and my negative 6 to get cos 2t on my left-hand side. Okay, so that's how come I ended up getting this. And that being equal to 0, now all we have to do is um, solve for the values of t. Now, what conditions have they given us? Well, they gave us that t lies between 0 and pi. But over here, you'll notice that we have a double angle. We have 2t. So what's going to happen first up is we're going to have um, two values. And that's true because they're asking us for the x-coordinates of the two stationary values of f. So the reality is, yes, they gave us the condition that t has to lie between pi and t has to lie between 0 and pi. But 2t would lie between 2 times 0 and 2 times pi. So this is our condition for that double angle situation that's taking place over here. So um, what we're going to do is say that, well, you have to find the inverse. Therefore, if cos 2t is equal to 0, then 2t is going to be equal to, uh, well, we have to find the cos inverse of pretty much uh, 0, right? Cos inverse of 0 is, I believe, uh, pi on 4. That's why I wrote this bit of information at the top, because I wanted you guys to recall your exact values, right? So let me just scroll up. Just let me minimize this so we can fit this on your screen here. Right, guys, so we have uh, cos inverse of 0 being equal to uh, pi on um, 2, sorry, not pi on 4, right? So we're going to have that equal to uh, pi on 2. Now, remember that this is a double angle. So you need to take an account for double. You need to kind of add a revolution. You need to add 2 pi so that you have a second value as well. So that answer is not only pi on 2, but it will also be add 2 pi to that. You'll get 2 pi plus pi is 3 pi on 2 as well, okay? And that's what 2t is equal to. So in a case like this where you have a double angle, you can't just say cos inverse of 0 is pi on 2. You have to consider the situation where you will generate two values if it's performing two sets of revolutions, okay? And therefore, t will have, a val have values of carrying across that 2, dividing both those values by 2, you will get pi on 4. Let me scroll up a little bit here. So let me rewrite that properly. You're going to get uh, pi on 4, comma, 3 pi on Okay, cool. So we have generated two values for uh, t there. And you can see we're almost finished. You see, they didn't exactly ask you um, at which values of t uh, does the function um, have stationary values. They asked us to find the x coordinates. So all you need to do is look around in your question and see what x is equal to. And uh, in this question, x is equal to 4 cos t. Ooh, let's just go. <laughs> A little bit of technical difficulties there, guys. So there we go. x is equal to 4 cos t. So very, very simple. Um, we are just going to go perhaps to the side right here. And we're going to state um, since x is equal to 4 cos of t. We have found two values of t. So uh, when, when t has a value of what's that, pi on 4, what are we going to get? We're going to get x to be equal to 4 cos of pi on 4, right? And that's why I wrote that bit of information at the top in case you guys forgot uh, cos of pi on 4 is root 2 on 2. So that's 4 by root 2 all on 2. Um, so that's just 2 root 2. 
So I'll just clean that up right here. That's just two root two. And also when t has a value of three pi on four, that's just x is equal to four plus of three pi on four. All right. And um, that's three pi on four up here is minus two, minus root two on two. So that will just simply give us minus two root two. All right, I just clean it up one time. So those are your x coordinates of the two stationary values of your function. And that's your final answer. Um, so I hope you guys were able to understand the process. I think for a lot of students, this part would have been challenging. Um, I think you would have gotten to the part to equate your gradient to zero. And perhaps you would have reached here. And most of you guys would have generated one value for t and uh, forgotten about the second one. So for example, just point to note, if you had gotten cos of 3t being equal to zero, that means three revolutions. It means you would have had to add two pi again. That's five pi on two, just so you know how it works, right? So be very observant of that um, angle. If it's double, triple, et cetera, you have to keep adding rotationary values um, to solve for all possibilities. Okay, guys? And uh, that's the solution for this question. Um, please stay tuned. We have another part to this paper, 2016. And then finally, we'll be moving on to 2015, guys. Hold on. We'll get there. But I promise you, after reviewing this entire tutorial, you are going to be so ready for any question on this type of differentiation. Hold on. Okay, guys, here is the final part to 2016, uh, and um, it's definitely not related, but it looks familiar. We did a question like this already, and um, this is going to be a breeze, because in this one, we're only going to uh, be finding the partial derivative of w with respect to x. So let's start this question. We know how to do this, right? So we have our function w, and it's in terms of uh, x and y. And it's a ln function, and what we're going to do is we're going to just split that up using our rules, right? So our rules go like this, ln of 2x plus y minus ln of uh, x minus 10. Okay, so we have our function. It's a nice split, and they're simply asking us to find uh, delta w differentiating partially with respect to x only okay cool i can do this um observing here i do have x present as my variable so that would mean um differentiating that with respect to x only will give me two on my numerator then in my second part i do have x as well so i will get a derivative there that's x minus 10 the derivative of x is simply one and uh pretty much that's it i mean it's not a proof they did not explicitly state for you to simplify this in any particular format um you can if you wanted to you could uh i guess you know you can find a common denominator you can bring it together if you like um let's do it because it looks way too easy okay let's just just uh bring the denominators together here. So we'll get um, 2x plus uh, y, all right, um, by x minus 10. And uh, then you have um, 2 by x minus 10 minus 1 by, you have 2x plus y. Okay, I like to put everything in brackets so that um, I don't make mistakes when I have these signs in the middle here. Okay, and uh, simplifying that, you'll get 2x minus 2x is 0 on top. And you'll get minus, uh, what's that, minus 20. Uh, that's uh, plus y, is it? Yeah, all over uh, 2x plus y by x minus 10. 
All right, guys, so um, pretty much that's as simple as it gets. I don't see any possibility of anything uh, canceling on the numerator with the denominator. And I would say that is your final answer. Of course, from here, if you wanted to, you could use the, uh, you could have used the, um, the quotient rule to differentiate. If you chose to do that, um, it'll be correct as well. Um, you should be able to get the same answer. Um, try it out. Tell me what you guys get. Okay, so that's the end of 2016. Next up, 2015. Finally. I um, just wanted to take note that in expanding brackets here, this is supposed to be a minus, right? Because minus uh, over here by this plus gives me a minus, just to make that correction. Okay, guys, so I just tried searching and I'm having a bit of trouble because I've been recording for quite a while. So uh, my system is just uh, giving some little glitches. I will have to do the 2015 another time, and that's okay. Um, I think we covered a lot. The 2015 is just another parametric equation, so it's no different than the other years we have encountered. And um, I hope you guys found this tutorial session um, very clear. Uh, if I made small errors and stuff, please be sure to just mention them down in the comments below. Okay, guys. And um, I look forward to seeing you guys post um, a request soon so that I can continue to help you guys out. I hope you guys are doing well. So take care and see you guys soon. Bye.